ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليما كثيرا وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار We only have a few more classes, inshallah, as we to deal with these common errors that people make in the salat. There are quite a few that we left out because they're not as glaring or as prominent as others, the ones that we have mentioned. But today, inshallah, as we want to deal with some of the mistakes that are pretty common that are made with the prayer but we're going to deal with the things that people do after the salat and there are many issues but the last one that we want to do that is inside of the salat itself is that many people are not aware of the proper way of coming to the masjid late and connecting to the saf especially when there is one person already praying a person comes to the masjid and what many people commonly do is they get to the right of that person and they stand just a little bit behind him and that's the wrong thing to do in actuality the person should be even with the individual who is leading him in the prayer some of the scholars of al-islam they said that the person should be behind just as a precautionary measure so that he's not in front. So they said he should be behind. And they were just trying to make sure that the individual didn't stay in front or stand in front. Similar to the people in the Hanifi Madhab who touch their ears with their fingers like this. There's no delil and no hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu touched his earlobes like this at all. But the scholars from that Medhab, they said that the person should touch his ears to be sure that he raises his arms above his shoulders. So if he touches his ears, then he surely did that. But what happens is the thing becomes the religion. So the person thinks the prayer consists of touching his ears. So the point here is that the scholars of Islam, they came with these issues that are known as al-istihsan, al-istihsan. It's a good idea. It has its reason behind it. But there are rules and regulations before a person can implement something that comes from al istihsan And if the door was open for everything to be determined by istihsan, then there's going to be a new religion. And this is why Imam al-Shafi'i said about this particular issue, al istihsan من استحسن فقد شرع. The one who believes you can do istihsan to make something halal or haram or the sunnah, then you have legislated in the religion. But anyway, the point here is the individual should stand directly even with the imam. An extension of that issue is if a third person comes and there are two people who are standing there praying, and this is the big issue here, the big mushkila. If the third person comes and there are two people who are there, then the third person, he should either get on the left side of the imam or he should get on the right side next to that individual who is on the right side of the imam. So if the third person comes to join the prayer, what should he do? He should come in and he should stand next to the guy who is to the right of the imam or he should go to the left and be even with the imam. As for pulling this person who is on the right side of the imam or pushing the imam 
this is a great mistake and it's something that it shouldn't be done at all. It shouldn't be done. And the reason why it shouldn't be done is what I'm telling you has delil to it. Whereas pushing and pulling doesn't have any delil to it whatsoever. During the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam personal and private life, he was sleeping in the house of one of his companions, Anas ibn Malik's auntie. And Anas ibn Malik was in the house with another young man. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood up to make Qiyamul Layl. So while he was praying by himself in Qiyamul Layl, one of the young men came and he stood to the left of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet took the boy and brought him from behind him and brought him to his right. And he was even with the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that goes to show that if one person comes to join the prayer, he doesn't stand to the left. He should stand to the right and he should stand even with him. And the hadith also goes to show that if you move in your prayer, your prayer is not rendered baltila because you moved. Some of the madahib tell you that if you move more than three times, then you have to start your prayer over again. So, the boy came, he stood to the left, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pulled him over to the right while they were praying. The second boy came and he stood to the left of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Prophet Muhammad took both of the boys and he pushed them back. He pushed them back. So if you come and you're the second person who came to pray with the Imam, there's someone to his right, you should stand to the right of that individual or stand to the left of that in the, of the Imam and leave it up to the Imam. If he wants to push you back, you get back. If he wants to leave you there, he leaves you there. And this is what happened with Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. May Allah be pleased with him with two of his students, Al-Qama and Al-Aswad. But we're going to talk about that, inshallah, when we come to the issue of making the second jama'ah in the masjid. Bi-idhnillah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he prayed in the middle, and he put one of them to the right, and he put the other one to his left, and that's how they prayed. Radiyallahu anhu. As for pushing and pulling, this issue is not from the religion. You let the imam, he makes the decision, are they going to stay? And then the people can continue to come and they can continue to come, no problem. If that's what happens, that's what happens. People continue to come, no problem. But don't push anyone and don't pull anyone. Second issue, khwani, after the prayer, from the mistakes is this issue of the second jama'at and establishing the second jama'at after the first jama'at has been finished. The majority of the ulama and the companions, رضي الله عنهم, they were of the opinion that if there is a masjid, and that masjid has an imam who is always there, they call him the imam ratib. He's the permanent imam. As opposed to the masjid where you see like if you're in Mecca and Medina, you want to travel from Mecca to Al Medina or from Al Medina to Mecca, on your way you have the turuqat, you have the way you're going. And then there are just masjids on the side of the road for people to just come and pray. But there's no imam in that masjid. Those masjids are there to facilitate ease for the musafirin. So if it is a masjid, like this masjid has an imam, Masjid al-Rahmah has an imam. Masjid al-Sunnah has an imam. The masjid where they have an imam, they're making the adhan, there is the Juma in that masjid. Then the majority of the ulama of al-Islam, the close companions, were of the opinion that once that imam leaves the salat, Fajr, Dhuhr, Maghrib, Asr, Isha, once he leaves the prayer and is done, then you can and you shouldn't have a second jama'at in the masjid. Something that is wrong and it shouldn't be done. And as I mentioned, Ikhwani, from those scholars who took this position, there are many, but just to name a few, Al-Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, Al-Imam Malik, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, Al-Layth ibn Sa'ad, Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, and his two companions, his two main students, Abu Hassan, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, as well as 
Abu Yusuf. Al-Imam al-Awza'i, the majority of the ulama of al-Hadith, they say you shouldn't do this. And there are delils that are pretty strong that show why you shouldn't do it. From them is what the companion Abu Bakr, not Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, but Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went to another part of Medina to solve a problem. Some people were arguing with each other and they had a problem. So he went to deal with the issue to make islah. When he went over there and he was dealing with the issue, he came back and they delayed him. When he came back, the people had already prayed. When he came inside of the masjid, instead of making a second jama'at, he went inside of his house and he gathered up his family members and he led them in the salat that he had missed. So if the salat in the masjid, the second jama'at, was something that was permissible and the re rewards and the virtues of getting 27 rewards because you're making it in the masjid and jama'at, then the Prophet wasallam, the one who told us about this, he would have demonstrated it to us. He would have demonstrated it to us when he did that because in his masjid are always people in the masjid, just like this masjid. There are always people who miss the salat and there are always people in the masjid. But we don't find him saying to those people who came late, hey, let's make the second jama'at, or saying to the people who were there, hey, you guys, you want to make the second jama'at so that we can do another jama'at and get the reward. Another delil for that is what the companion said. Al-Imam Al-Hasan Al-Basri, who was taught by the companions, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he said, if the companions came to the masjid and they found that the salat had been prayed, they used to pray individually. If they came to the masjid and they saw that the salat had been prayed, then they would pray individually. They wouldn't pray together. That's a clear proof and a clear indication of what the Nabi left for them and left them upon, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That issue that I mentioned to you about Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, and what was collected by Imam Abdul Razak in his book, Al Musannaf. And that book, Kitab al Musannaf, the goal and the objective behind the book is he gathered up the statements and the actions of what the companions did. He has a lot of hadith of the Prophet in that book, but the main goal and the objective of the book is what did the companions do? What did they do? So anyone who's trying to pattern his Islam, his deen, his ibadah, his aqidah after the companions, then this book is the bedrock for that type of information. He brought a narration in which Abdullah bin Mas'ud came out with his two students, Masruq or Al-Aswad and Al-Qama. May Allah be pleased with both of them and Rahma upon them. They came to the masjid. When they came to the masjid, they found that the people prayed the salat. It's done. So what did they do? Abdullah bin Mas'ud went back home. And like I told you, he put one of them to the right and the other one to the left. And they made the salat. And I told you many times, the companions are on different levels in terms of virtues, in terms of knowledge, in terms of what they did. Abdullah bin Mas'ud was one of those companions. He was ma'roof, mashhoor, well-known for his tamassuk with the sunnah, for his knowledge of the sunnah, for his knowledge about the evils of innovation and the dangers of innovation. So Abdullah bin Mas'ud doesn't mean he's always right, doesn't mean that he's ma'asum and he never made a mistake, but he was one of those companions who was an expert in warning the people about the innovation and the nature of the innovation. So if it was something that was from the sunnah, he would have come into the masjid to pray, although he missed the jama'at, he would establish the jama'at with the two people who were with him who also missed the jama'at. So those are from the clear proofs. But there are other proofs that the ulama of al-Islam, they use, like the hadith in Sayyid Bukhari and Muslim, the Nabi, he mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if it hadn't been for the women and the children, he would have told someone to lead the prayer. And then he would have gone with some of the youngsters of al Medina, and he would have burnt the houses down of the people who didn't come to the masjid. 
the scholars use that as a proof to show there's no second jamaah because why would the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam burn the houses down of the people who didn't attend the first jamaah if there can be a second jamaah and a third jamaah don't burn their houses down because they may miss this jamaah but some of them are going to come late and they're going to pray a second jamaah and a third jamaah so that's one of the delils that the ulama of al-islam use and other than that and they even use some ayat like the ayat of uh, Masjid al-Dirar. Masjid al-Dirar. The masjid that the hypocrites built in order to divide the Muslims. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا دِرَارًا وَكُفْرًا وَتَفْرِيقًا بَيْنًا مُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِرْصَادًا لِمَنْ حَارَبَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ That ayat, those people, Allah said, they built the masjid to spread kufr. They built the masjid to hurt the Muslims. And they built the masjid to divide the Muslims. To divide the Muslims. So those scholars like Imam Shafi said, this is a delil, shouldn't have a second masjid because one of the characteristics of the munafiqeen who built that masjid is they attempted to divide the Muslims. So if there's a second jama'ah, people can use that as an opportunity not to pray behind the first imam. Everybody has to make it his job, everybody has to make it his business try to get to the Salat to be with the unified community, with the Muslims. If you happen to miss that, then no problem, because you didn't mean it. But if there's a second Jamaat, a third Jamaat, and so forth and so on, the person can lollygag, take his time. And even worse than that, it used to happen in Mecca, where the Madahib people prayed at four different times. The Hanbali people prayed Dhuhr first, and then after them, the Maliki people prayed Salat al-Dhuhr, and then after them, the Hanafi people played Dhuhr. Then after them, the Shafi people prayed Dhuhr. Four prayers for each and every prayer. And that's how it used to be. Because of the hatred and the ta'asub of this madhab stuff that the Muslims were upon. Now I understand and I acknowledge and I recognize there are some scholars who say, no, you can make the second jama'ah. And we respect the ikhtilaf. But it seems, as I told you, what the companions did is always the best thing, it's always the safest thing. I think the only delil that they have that is really worth, it has weight to it. The Prophet prayed sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam with his companions. And then a man came into the masjid late. He missed a jama'ah. So the man, the Prophet says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which one of you would give sadaqah to that man? Give him sadaqah. Abu Bakr said, I will. So Abu Bakr went and prayed with that man. That goes to show there's a second jama'ah in the masjid. If you look at that situation, it is a second jama'ah, but Abu Bakr had already prayed. Other people didn't come and join that individual. Abu Bakr already prayed and he was giving the man sadaqah. And you didn't see this thing coming from the companions. Every time someone comes in late, other people come and join him in the prayer, even if they prayed. But with it happening one time, it goes to show it's something that is permissible. Someone comes in, he missed a prayer. Abu Bakr is going to get up and he's going to pray his sunnah prayer. And that man who came in, that man is praying the wajib prayer that he missed. It's not the man is praying the wajib prayer and Abu Bakr is praying the wajib prayer and therefore it's the second jama'ah. No. And that hadith and incident proves as well that the imam's niyyah, doesn't have to be the same niyyat as the person who he is leading in the salah. The imam can be praying salat al-dhuhr and the person who he is leading is praying salat al-asr, for an example. The imam is praying at taraweeh and the one who is behind him is praying salat al-isha, for an example. So the imam's niyyat doesn't have to be the niyyat of the person who he's leading. So this is what we wanted to present in regard to that particular issue. In addition to that, Ikhwani, what we want to mention very briefly and very quickly, a few issues. After the Salat, from the mistakes that are pretty common, whether it's being done on an individual basis, one person does it, or collectively, quite a few issues. The shaking of the hands that you find in certain masjids where it became a part of the prayer itself. So after the Salat, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah, people start to shake hands, especially for Fajr prayer. 
And it's something that people do as if to say to the people we're praying, Fajr, alhamdulillah, it's good to see you here. It's a new day. I'm happy to see you, alhamdulillah, you're in a masjid, we have life. So we start shaking hands like that. There's nothing wrong with shaking hands. Shaking hands is ibadah. It is ibadah. It is an ibadah that if a person does it the right way, he'll get a lot of rewards. And from the rewards of shaking hands, is that the Nabi told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if two Muslims meet and they shake hands, then their sins fall off of them the way the leaves fall off of a tree. But there's a time and a place of shaking hands. And this is not one of them. Another issue. The statement, تَقَبَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنَّا وَمِنْكُمْ After every prayer, تَقَبَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنَّا وَمِنْكُمْ This تَقَبَّلَ اللَّهُ is from what has been added on to the ibadat in al-Islam that, again, the Prophet ﷺ never left that for the people, so it should be avoided altogether. As for the Eid day, it is a fact that the companions, if someone, if someone were to have seen the Eid, they used to say that to each other after the Eid. They wouldn't say Eid Mubarak, they wouldn't say Eid Kareem, they would say, تَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ minna wa minkum. After the Eid, may Allah accept from us our Hajj. May Allah accept from us our Ramadan. So they would say that. تَقَبَّلَ Allah minna wa minkum. But after the prayer, this wasn't something that was a practice of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nor did the companions leave that for us. Also, the big mushkila of the dua, the dua, the dua. It should be understood, ikhwani, that the dua one of the times in which the dua is accepted is after the prayer. That's one of the times that the dua is accepted, after the prayer. But although that is the case, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't make the dua after the prayer. He used to make adhkar. He used to make adhkar. And a lot can be said about the adhkar, the proper way to do it and the improper way to do it. But he didn't make dua. So if an individual wants to make a dua here or there sometimes, no problem. Because there is a text that says that's one of the times the dua is accepted. So take advantage of it. Here or there. You want to take that opportunity? You can. But after each prayer, raising your hands up for dua, after each prayer, the imam raises his hand and the people raise their hand. And in these masajid, most of them, people don't even know what the imam is saying. They don't even know what he's saying. He's just saying some kalam. And the people are not, if you look at the people, they're not even paying attention. It's just something that is being done. So it should be avoided altogether. So those scholars of Al-Islam who wrote books about innovation, they always put that in there in the innovation, in the innovations that have been uh, introduced into the deen. The people who make the dua like that, community dua, individual dua, and then after that, wiping your face after making dua. There is no wiping of the face after dua except when a per, per, person's going to make a ruqya, a ruqya before he goes to bed, he wants to put the barakah of the Quran on himself, or he's just giving himself ruqya, he can wipe all over himself. The last thing that we want to mention, inshallah, azwajal, is after the salat is over, ikhwani, we have to teach ourselves, train ourselves, as well as those who we are responsible for, for the impermissibility of walking in front of the people who are praying to the best of your ability. The Prophet told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, لو يعلم المار بين يد المصلي ماذا كان عليه لانتظر أربعين If a person only knew the person who wants to walk in front of someone who's praying, if the one who wants to pass in front of him only knew what would be upon him in the way of sin, al ithim if he only knew, he will wait for 40. And the narrator of the hadith didn't say he will wait for 40 seconds, 40 minutes, 40 hours, 40 days, 40 months, 40 years, 40 centuries. He didn't say that. He said he will wait for 40. So it goes to show that we shouldn't do that. He also said when we talked about the sutra and the people who don't take sutras, that is a mistake in the prayer, big mistake. We dealt with that already, to pray without a sutra. And when we gave that discussion, some of the fiqh of the sutra, we mentioned that he said to the people who were praying, 
don't allow anyone to walk in front of you between you and your sutra. And if they try, stop him. And if he insists, then fight him while you're praying. You can be aggressive with him. And FYI, FYI, those scholars of Islam, they dealt with this issue and they said, if a Muslim was fighting someone, he's praying and he's trying to go in front of him and he tries to stop him, somehow he slips and he hits his head and he becomes concussed and he dies. This man didn't mean to do it, but that's what happened. Does he have to pay any blood money? Is he in trouble? Does he go to prison? Scholars of Islam said, no, he doesn't go to prison. And that's because there is a text that tells him he has the right to stop him. Now, that doesn't mean that the one who is trying to stop him, he goes crazy. There's an older gentleman. He doesn't have a lot of knowledge. The old sheikh, the old uncle, he wants to pass in front of you. He's 75 years old. And then when you try to stop him, he doesn't like what you're doing. And he's shocked. What are you doing? You're praying and you're stopping me? And then due to ignorance, he wants to go in front of you. So you know that hadith of the Nabi. So you grab the old man and you, no man, you got to have some fiqh. You have to look at the situation. You have to say to yourself, well, this is an old man. He probably doesn't understand and I'm going to hurt him. So you did let it go. But there's somebody else who comes by and you're, he can see that you're praying. He should take heed of, hey, you come in between my, me and my sutra. But anyway, the point is that if something were to happen to that individual in the process of being stopped, there's nothing upon the one who did it, provided he just didn't go crazy. What he did was ma'qul, and as a result of that, the, um, the sharia doesn't put him in trouble. So the point is, we have to be careful if people are praying not to walk in front of people after the salat, you're done. Those people who are not done, try not to walk in front of those individuals because, again, whoever does that, he is a shaitan. He's a shaitan because he's um, interrupting a person and his salat. Okay, Khwani, we're going to stop there. We just have two more presentations we want to do about the mistakes. One, about Juma, some of the mistakes of Juma, salat al Juma, and that issue about the um, sajdat al sahu. The sajdat al sahu. So we can do that the right way, inshallah. So if you guys, your brothers, have any questions, you can put your questions forward. Tafadu ya akhi. When a person comes in and we want to start a new role, you're the one who's coming in, you're going to start a brand new world. Where should you start? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he, as Aisha said, our mother, He used to be impressed with starting from the right in all of his affairs. So when he combed his hair, he started with his right. When he put his clothes on with the right, his shoe with the right, into the masjid, the right, everything was with the right. So that as a delil, that as a delil, we start from the right. But the Prophet never told the people start from the right. When he was making Hajj sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he went around the Kaaba seven times. He prayed two rakats behind the maqam of Ibrahim. He went he got some zamzam water, he drank it, came back to the Kaaba. He put his chest on the wall and then he looked towards Safa and Marwa. Which one does he start with? He said, Nabda will be my be my we're going to start with the one that Allah started with. Meaning what? That Allah said in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, inna safa wal marwa min sha'airillah. So Allah mentions safa first and then marwa. So he started off with that one. And so we start off with that one because he did it. When it comes to the prayer, the salat, he never says start from the right, from the middle or the left. But because of all of those ayat, you know, Ashab al yameen all of that. The right side is always the best. So you start from the right. But it's permissible to be in the middle as well. And that would have some delil too. The Sirat al Mustaqim is in the middle. Allah Ta'ala, He likes those things. The middle path is always the best path. So if someone wants to start in the middle, no problem. You start from the left, nobody can say that it's haram. No one can say that it's haram. 
So there's no clear text saying where we should start. No clear ayat, no clear hadith, but it's just istimbat, extracting the ruling. Aywa. Any more questions? for the Yahi. As we mentioned when we dealt with the taswit al-sufuf, when the Prophet turned around and told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hadhu bayn al-manakib, put your feet together, isto, wa la takhtalifu, he told them all of those things, one of the companions, he said, when he told us this, we put our heels next to the hill of our partner. And we put our ankle bones next to the ankle bone of our partner. So that's what should be done. For the person who can do it, then he should do it. For the person who can't do it, it's difficult for him to do it. Yeah, it should be the hills. It should be the hills. People put their hills together, the line is going to be straight. They put their toes and they line up from their toes, then that line won't be straight because some people's feet are bigger than others, obviously. someone is praying he doesn't have a sutra then you imagine where his sutra would be if he put his head down where would his sutra be and you can walk beyond that or in front of that because it wouldn't be fair for the person to be praying all the way over there and we can't walk we can't utilize this whole distance from there to here doesn't make any sense so the person just imagines if he had a sutra where would it be if he were to make sajda and then you go in front of him no problem with that pray it normally. Anybody anybody who misses the prayer and you catch the prayer, the Prophet he commanded, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ma adraktum fasallu wa ma fatakum fatimmu whatever you catch, go ahead and pray it and whatever you miss then make it up and complete it so if you came for salat al-isha and you came on the fourth raka then you do that one raka, and those people are going to say, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah, and you're going to get up. And it's your second raka. And when you do that second raka, you're going to stay down and do your tashahud because it's your second raka. And then after tashahud, you're going to get up and you're going to pray the last two raka. If you come for the last raka, for Salat al Maghrib, you made it for the last raka. That means that you're going to have three tashahud because you're going to do that last raka with them. You're going to do the tashahud. Then you're going to stand up and do the second raka. And you're going to stand down, stay down for the tashahud. Then you're going to get up for the third one. And you're going to do three tashahuds. So whatever you missed, the general rule is, whatever you missed, just make it up. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what you caught, ma adraktum, fasalluh. Whatever you caught, go ahead and pray it. Wa ma fatakum, fatimmu. Whatever passed you by, just make it up. Just complete it. Just complete it. And he told that to the people who were running to the masjid. He told the people who were running to the masjid, making noise. And we didn't mention some of these things. They were making noise. He said, إِذَا أَتَيْتُمْ إِلَى الْمَسْجِدْ فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالْوَقَارِ وَالسَّكِينَةِ If you come to the masjid, then come in a relaxed way. Come in a cool and a calm way. Take it easy. Like what we didn't mention. From the mistakes is to go down on your knees first. We didn't mention that. It's a point of ikhtilaf. The Nabi told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La tabruku buruk al-ibil. Don't go down the way the camel goes down, falling down on your knees. But I see it's an ikhtilaf issue that 
you know, I don't think I'm going to call that a mistake because other people have the other point of view and it's one of those types of issues. So we didn't mention that. Another issue we didn't mention at Kwani is the type of sitting. But I didn't mention about the things about this sitting because everyone doesn't have the ability to sit the way the sunnah says to sit. Most of us, many of us don't, we can't do that. But there is one sitting that I will mention right now. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he prayed, for an example, Salat al-Dhuhr, after making sajda, Akhi Sharif, I hope you can help me right here, right here. He, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, get on your knees, he would uh, sit on your, your toes up, your, yeah, like that, like that. He, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would sit like that. He would do like, he made sajda, and he sat up like this. And then he made sajda, and then he sat up with his feet like that. And then he got up. And then when he came for the second raka, he made sajda, and he sat, and his feet were like that. Then he made sajda again, and then when he sat, put your feet down now. Then he did like that when he did the second, when he sat for the tashahud. Yeah. So anytime he prayed a salat that had three rakat, he always ended up, he never sat like that. Any prayer that had two rakat, just two rakat, at the end of the rakat, he, at the end of the salat, he never sat like that. And there are a lot of people who sit like that throughout their prayer. You can sit like that for the first, all of the rakat, except when you're sitting down. Like the second rakat, you're sitting for the istiraha and the tashahud. You shouldn't sit like that. And for the third, last rakat for maghrib, and the fourth, last rakat for dhuhr, asr, and al-isha. Al-isha. Fadi akhi afdal. Now, you read Surah Al-Fatiha and you read another Surah of the Quran, but try not to read it out loud to bother the people who are around. But you read the way you would normally do it, that is what you do. Just Surah Al-Fatiha, the same way you would do it had you led the prayer. Any more questions, Ikhwani? That's authentic that they described the sutra of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said it was when he made sajda it was enough room for a small sheep to pass between where his head would be and where the sutra would be and that just is an indication that your head shouldn't be right up on the sutra <coughs> nor should it be very far away. Fadiyah. person is praying because he came from traveling he, for an example something happened he prayed Salat al-Maghrib already and he's praying Isha and the people the Imam is praying Maghrib you can do one of two things when they get on the third rakah and the Imam gets up when they get on the third no it's the other way around Because that way it would be no problem. So if the people are praying, the imam is praying Isha, and you're praying Maghrib, what should you do? You're praying Maghrib. You have one or two choices. You can wait on the third rakat. You stay down when they get up for the fourth rakat, and you just stay there making dua. And you just stay there until they get back with you, and then you salam out. And that, inshallah, is the best thing to do. The other option is for an individual to do his tashahud, salamu alaikum, salamu alaikum, then get up, 
and do the Isha and catch them and get back with them. Both of those options are there because the only way you're going to know what to do is through ijtihad. There's no hadith, no ayat telling us these are the positions of the ulama of the past. Some said this, some said that. Some said it's up to you to uh, do it. And they refuted each other uh, concerning the issue. But what else you're going to do? Okay, khwani, we're going to stop here, inshallah. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa shadu an la ilaha ila anta staghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.